Hey, little friends. I'm doing an extra podcast this week because I've been listening to a lot of the news, and maybe you follow the news like I do. But lots of people are very disturbed, and I also see it on the emails sometimes I receive, that people are wondering if this is the end of time. Is this the time that Jesus is coming back? Is this the end of the age? And there's just a lot of confusion about that. And then when I began to listen about the uh, concerns about the eclipse on Monday, April 8th, and listening to different people describe it uh, in an interesting way. And there's certainly a lot of signs and, and symbols that are in the way this um, eclipse is coming across to America. If I have it right, maybe I don't, but the first eclipse seven years ago came from Salem, Oregon, all the way down to the southeast somehow. And then this one is coming up out of Texas where the, the people are crossing the border and going up to the northeast. And the ones from Salem, Salem, Oregon, came across seven cities seven years ago, which were called Salem. And Salem is a word for peace. But this eclipse is coming across from the south, from down where the, um, the migrants, uh, the illegal migrants, are crossing into the United States. I forgot what it's called, but that's not my plan to really talk about that very much. But it's going to be passing, passing, through, passing through a number of cities with the name of Nineveh. Nineveh was the city that God wanted to judge. But because they repented, he didn't do it. So that's not what I want to talk with you about. I really want to talk with you about something else. Several number of years ago, I posted a blog about a vision that George Washington had. And this is what I want to read to you. Mostly I'm going to be reading to you. It's not very long, so I hope you can stay with me. But as you know, I believe in dreams and visions and prophecies. And it says in St. Peter at Pentecost, you know, the Holy Spirit was poured out. Soon it will be Pentecost Sunday, not very long away. We just came through Easter. It will be Pentecost. And at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out. And there's a wonderful promise in the Old Testament that God promises to pour out the Holy Spirit. He promises because they all didn't have the Holy Spirit in the Old Covenant. But the New Covenant Jesus made possible, when I talked about last Friday, it is finished. That a New Covenant was in order. A new covenant was created. It's a new covenant you and I are called to live by faith in. This is what I want to talk to you about because what's going on in our country and in the world around us, it's easy to become fearful. But there's a scripture in Luke chapter 18. It's one scripture. It's a short one. And Jesus has been talking and teaching to the people. But then he says, now I was telling them a parable. Show them at all times they ought to pray and not to lose heart. This is why I want to share this vision with you that George Washington had at Valley Forge in 19, I mean, 1777. Because we don't want to lose heart. It's very important that we keep our hearts encouraged, that we keep our faith uh, focused on God and on Jesus Christ. That in the New Covenant, we're called to walk by faith and not by sight, not by what's going on all around us, but we're called to use our faith, trusting God to lead and guide us through whatever turbulent times are coming across our country. So today I want to read to you a vision that George Washington had at Valley Forge. So I'm going to be reading quite a bit. It's only about four minutes long, and I hope you can stay with me. But it's also been on my blog, and I've noticed over the years that a number of times people find that blog and they like it and they want to comment on it that it intrigues them, because people always want to know what the future is going to be. And in my experience, God likes to prepare us for the future. In my experience, God likes to prepare us for the future. I had a dream of a telephone call, and my brother called me on the telephone in my dream and said, Mom is dying. And six months later, I got the same phone call, and my mother was sick and was dying. So God often prepares us for what's about to happen. I remember when I went to Israel, and, and I didn't get to Israel, but I ended up in, um, in uh, Rome. Yeah, I was in Rome because the flight had to stop suddenly because there was a strike in, in Athens. And, but then I'm walking around Rome, and suddenly God brought back to my mind a dream I had had six months before that I had been in Rome. So I believe in a God who likes to prepare us for what's coming ahead. But there's something you may not know about. And we can perish because we don't have enough knowledge, we don't have enough understanding. Because we don't, we can become very frightened and very fearful. And God doesn't want us to live in fear. He doesn't want me or you to live in fear. 
says in the New Testament, God has not given us a spirit of fear. Should I say that again? God has not given you a spirit of fear. A spirit. The fear that you have is not your own fear. It's coming from a demonic spirit who is causing you to be afraid. So you need to understand that we're living in a spiritual warfare. There's a great war going on in the heavenlies, in the second heaven. And you and I are part of that. Once we become a believer in Christ, we're called to be part of that warfare. We're called to take our part in the warfare and do what God calls us to do. Tremendous warfare, but the victory is guaranteed at the end. If you read Book of Revelation, you see who wins the victory. God's people, the church. Jesus is the head, but we are his body. And everything is under his feet. So it's important that you and I know how to be led by the Holy Spirit. So today, suddenly, I said to my husband, you remember that blog I put about George Washington's vision? I feel like I need to put it out on a podcast today. And so that's why I'm doing it. I'm taking the time, and I hadn't planned on doing this. It wasn't not my idea for today. But I'm going to share it with you, and you may never have heard it. And perhaps you have, and maybe it's not important to you. But I believe in dreams because of what St. Peter said in Pentecost. I believe in visions, and I believe in prophecies. Dreams, visions, and prophecies. That's why I've been doing a series on dreams, because God speaks to us in the night through dreams, but he speaks to us through visions and through prophecies. So this was George Washington's vision. I'm going to try to read it to you. I'll stop a little bit so um, my voice doesn't get tired. But this vision was, is um, recorded in the Library of Congress. Some people doubt it and don't think it's a real story, that somebody made it up. And you'll have to decide for yourself. But it's George Washington's vision. So I'm going to read a little bit out, OK? The father of our country is George Washington. He was our first president. You may not know that, but George Washington, when he became president, took all of his uh, cabinet and they made a knelt down before God and made a covenant with God that this nation would belong to God. I don't know if you know about covenants, but he, Abraham, George Washington made a covenant that this land, America, a unique land, no other country is like this land that has promised his freedom, freedom of speech. You know, we're slowly we're losing these freedoms and we know that the, the uh, uh, what do they call it when they take a, a vote? Uh, not a vote, but they do something and they say, M most Americans believe we're going on a downhill trail. They're not happy in the trend that America is going on. They're, they feel like we're missing the boat. We're going in the wrong direction. And so God, so this, we need to understand that we have missed the mark. We have forgotten something as America. We forgot who God is and God we trust is written on our money. Yet we have forgotten God. There's a scripture in Psalms that talks about a nation who forgets its God. A nation who forgets its God. That's what's happened. You know what happened last Easter on Sunday. You know what our current president did, right? I won't repeat that, no, but just you can look it up and find out what he did. It was not in honor of the resurrection. It was not in honor of Easter and Jesus Christ. It's not in honor of meaning that life comes out of death that you're our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, rose from the dead. And that guarantees you a future, an eternal life, that you would live in a place that's a lot better than probably here. But this is a promise that God said he'd pour out his spirit and we would have dreams, visions, and prophecies. So this is several hundred years ago I'm talking to you about. And uh, he was a man of prayer. I don't know if you're aware of that, but George Washington was a man of prayer. We've all read how he went to the thicket, they call it the thicket, back back into the woods alone. Many times to pray during the winter, his army was at Valley Forge. You remember the battle at Valley Forge? It was a winter time, it was cold, and his soldiers didn't have enough even on their feet to keep their feet from freezing. It looked like the battle was lost for a country that had the independence. It had freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of rights, freedom of property. We had a lot of freedoms in this country that slowly were losing. But George Washington would pray. And, but little, little, not very many people know about the vision he had one day when he was praying. This is what I want to read to you about. The first-hand account was given in 1859. The first-hand account of this vision was in 1859 by an old soldier named Anthony Sherman. 
Anthony Sherman, and he gave it to a writer named Wesley Bradshaw, who published it, The Vision. And in the vision, God revealed to George Washington the future of three great perils, three great perils that will come across our republic. So this is why I want to read it to you, because I want you to take heart. I want you to understand that God already knows what's going on in this country. He already knows what's about to happen. He knows where we're at right now. He knows where you're at right now. We must put our trust in the living God that he is with you, friends. That he'll not leave you. He'll not depart from you. He will always be for you. And he will strengthen you and he will guide you if we put our faith in him. If we remind him, I'm trusting you, God, to guide me in the future days and weeks and years and months ahead. We must be put walk by faith and not by sight. So this is a story that was told. And it's a phenomenal, like they hear, importantly heavenly message for all of us at this hour. And uh, this uh, man named, um, I said his name was um, Anthony Sherman. He was a soldier with George Washington at Valley Forge. And he was back and he's visiting Independence Hall. And he said to the author, he said, let us go into the hall. I want to tell you about an incident in George Washington's life. One which no one knows except me. No one alive knows this story. But if you live, you'll see it verified. So he, I'm going to read now to you, okay? From the opening of the revolution, we experienced all phases of fortune. Now good and now ill. One time victorious, another time conquered. But the darkest period we had, I think, was in Washington, after several reverses, retreated to Valley Forge, where he resolved to pass the winter of 1777. His soldiers were in destitute. They didn't have enough clothing, enough, enough shoes to wear. And here was our, our, our valiant, the general, who believed yet that God wanted to birth this country. And he stood his ground, and he held his ground, and he kept interceding and praying for America. And he says, so one day, I've um, well remembered the chilly winds whistling through the leafless leaves, though the sky was cloudless, and the sun shone brightly. But George Washington remained in his quarters nearly all afternoon, alone. But when he came out, I noticed that his face was a shade paler than usual. There seemed to be something different on his mind, of more than ordinary importance. Returning just after the dusk, he sent an orderly with a, a, a dispatch orderly to the quarters of his office, who was presently in attendance. After a preliminary conversation about a half an hour, Washington gazed out his companion with a strange look of dignity, which he alone could command, he said to the latter. And he says, I don't know whether it's owing to the anxiety of my mind about what's going on in this war or what this afternoon is, but as I was sitting at my table engaged in preparing a dispatch, something in the apartment seemed to disturb me. Looking up, I beheld something opposite me, a singularly beautiful being, a female. I was so astonished, for I've been given strict orders that I don't want to be disturbed. Please let me be alone. After some moments, then I found language to ask, why are you here? Why are you in my presence? And I asked it a second and a third and a fourth time. And I repeated my question, but nobody, she didn't answer me. This mysterious visitor didn't answer me, except for a slight raising of her eyes. So you can guess that, that might be um, an angel. We don't know who it was. But Abraham, um, George Washington had this experience. So he says, then continues on telling his story. By this time, I felt strange sensations spreading through me. I would have risen, but the gaze of the being before me made, me impo made it impossible. I tried to speak again to address her, but my tongue was useless, as if it had become paralyzed. He couldn't talk to this stranger who had entered his apartment. He wanted to ask, why are they there? What does she want? What is it you're here for? But his tongue was paralyzed. He couldn't, you've never been tongue-tied, right? 
where you're not able to speak to somebody, you couldn't get your tongue going. Sometimes I know what that's like. I want to speak to you and tell you so many things and I'm not able to get my mind and my mouth together, I guess. Sometimes it's like that. But I'm telling you this today because I want you to be encouraged that our country is not alone, no matter what's going to happen in the future, that God knows what's happening. And he wants you to take heart. And that's why I'm reading you with this. So stay with me if you can, please. So a second and a third, oh, he tried four or five times, but he couldn't get any answer from this woman. By this time, I felt strange sensations spreading through me. I would have risen, but he says I couldn't do it. I tried to speak, my tongue was useless. It's like it paralyzed. But then a new influence, a mysterious, potent, irresistible look possession of me, took possession of me. All I could do was to gaze steadily, vacantly at my unknown visitor. I don't know if you've ever experienced the presence of God come into your room. I have. I've experienced God's presence come into the room. It's like a cloud moves in. It's this glory moves in. And, you, and I know my husband's had an experience where something came into the room and he didn't know how to respond to it. It shook him so deeply because God is a mighty God and he's far beyond a human being. And when you encounter him, it take, shakes us, terribly shakes us. And this is what Washington is happening to him. He's shaken. He doesn't know what to do. But he's trying to fight a war. He's trying to fight against the British Army. And he's trying to keep this country so it can be free from um, dictators, from somebody who wants to dictate everything that's going on. So gradually the surrounding atmosphere seemed to fill with sensations and it grew luminous. Luminous means filled with light. Everything about me seemed to rarefy the mysterious visitor, which she herself became more airy and yet more distinct to my sight than before. I began to feel as maybe I was dying or rather to experience the emotions and feelings of dying. I've often wondered what dying would be like, he writes. But I did not think, I could not reason, I could not move. He just was paralyzed, he could not move because of the presence of God that entered into that little apartment. God had heard his prayers and came to answer him, to give him a vision of the future of this country that he was founding. This is why it's important that we don't lose heart. No matter what you hear in the news, no matter what you see what's going on in the White House or uh, in Israel or in um, Europe, whatever is going on, that you keep your eyes set on Jesus Christ and put your trust in him. But presently, he said, I heard a voice saying to me. This is important because he hears this voice about four or five times in this vision. And he says, son of the republic, Look and learn. I want to repeat that because I want you to pay attention to it. Son of the Republic, look and learn. Look and learn. It says in the Old Testament, my people perish for lack of knowledge, but they have no understanding. But God the Father wants George Washington to understand, to learn something about this nation, that he can leave this vision with you and I that will give us hope almost 300 years later that we can have confidence and hope of what's going on across our border. I'm going to get to that in a minute. You'll see it in his vision, what's coming, invading our border, across our border. And you can see it prophesied here in his vision. That's what touched me today when I read it. I thought, I need to share this with you. So he said, the same time my visitor extended her arm eastward, I now beheld a heavy white vapor at some distance rising upon the fold, fold upon fold. This gradually dissipated, I looked upon a strange scene. Before me lay a vast plain, all the countries of the world, Europe, Asia, Africa, and America. I saw rolling and tossing between Europe and America the billows of the Atlantic Ocean. Between Asia and America, I saw the Pacific. And then this mysterious voice said to me again, Son of the Republic, look and learn. Son of the Republic, look and learn. That moment I beheld a dark shadowy being like an angel standing or rather floating in midair between Europe and America. Dipping water out of the ocean in the hollow of each hand, he sprinkled some upon America with his right hand, while with his left hand he cast some over Europe. Immediately a cloud arose from these countries and joined in mid-ocean. For a while it seemed to remain stationary and it moved slowly westward until it enveloped America in its murky folds. Sharp flashes of lightning gleamed 
through the intervals, and I heard the groans and cries of the American people. The people who have looked at this vision suggest that this experience, this number first experience, was about the war for America with Britain. It's about the war for independence. Now, the second one happened next. A second time, the angel dipped water from the ocean and sprinkled it out as before. It's called the second great peril. There are three great perils that are going to try to destroy America. So this, I'm talking about the second great war, a great peril. The cloud, dark cloud was then drawn back to the ocean, <clears throat> whose heavy billows it sank from view. But a third time, I heard the mysterious voice saying, what did the voice say? Son of the Republic, look and learn. Are you a son of the Republic? Do you belong to America? Are you a citizen of the United States? Then we all are our sons of the Republic. We are all called to look and learn. Yeah, look and learn. Yeah. Son of the Republic, look and learn. And this time the dark shadowy angel turned his face southward, southward from Africa. I saw an ill-omened specter approach our land. It filtered, uh, this is from Africa, notice that? It, filled, it, fitted so, it flitted softly and heavily over every town and city of the United States. The inhabitants probably um, presently set themselves in battle array against each other. As I continued looking, I saw a bright angel, another angel comes, on whose brow rested a crown of light, on which was traced the word union. Hear the word union, U-N-I-O-N. The United States is a unique country because it's made up of all these different states. It's a union of different states, 51 states, is it? Uh, it's, a, it's a union of states. The federal government isn't totally in charge. It's a union of states. And so it's called a union. And he was bearing the American flag. This angel was carrying the American flag on with him. And he placed the flag between the divided nation. He said, remember, you are brethren. Here's the angel with the American flag and saying the word union. And he says, remember, you are brethren. Instantly, the inhabitants casting down their weapons, they threw down their guns and whatever they had. They became friends more and united around the national standard of American flag. This was the Civil War, is what they're, they're suggesting here. It probably was the Civil War, because you saw from Africa. So it was the issue of the Civil War that America had sinned and had to change its policy and how it see, saw the difference between the different types of people in this country. However, there's one more third and more fearful peril. This is the last one, friends. This is why I want you to hear this one most. Again, I heard the mysterious voice saying, what did the voice say? Son of the Republic, look and learn. Son of the Republic, look and learn. Many people don't want to know what's going on in our country. They want to be ignorant. They don't want to understand what the policies are, what the, the votes are, what's, what they're voting on in Congress, or what the, what the president is stamping on, yes or no on. They, they're ignorant. They don't want to know. But here the angel is saying, Son of the Republic, look and learn. At this time, the dark, shadowy angel placed a trumpet to his mouth. Here's the word trumpet. And he blew three distinct blasts. And taking water from the ocean, he sprinkled it upon Europe, Asia, and Africa. Then my eyes beheld a fearful scene. Then my eyes beheld a fearful scene. From each of these continents arose thick black clouds that were soon joined into one. And throughout this mass, there gleamed a dark red light. Now listen carefully, which I saw hordes of armed men. These men moving with the cloud marched by land and by sea. And he said to America, by sea to America, which country was enveloped in the volume of clouds. And I dimly saw these vast armies devastate the whole country and the villages, towns, and cities, which I'd seen springing up. After the Civil War, the country came back and began to grow and develop again. But here we have a third great peril for the United States, and that's what you and I are living in. 
Think about what's coming across the border. Think about what you're hearing on the news. Do we need to be afraid of what might happen with the people who have crossed our border illegally? From every country under the world, under the sun. We don't even know what countries they've come from. But they're like a mass that have marched across and sailed. And it's like a, volley, a cloud of vast armies. As my ears listened to the thundering of the cannons, which is war, right? Clashing of the swords and the shouts and cries of millions in mortal combat. The shouts and cries of millions in mortal combat. I again heard the mysterious voice saying, Son of the Republic, look and learn. Son of the Republic, look and learn. Where the voice had ceased, the dark shadowing angel placed his trumpet once more to his mouth and blew a long and fearful blast. Instantly, instantly, a light of a thousand suns shone down from above me. Here's George Washington talking about his vision. Instantly, when that trumpet blew, he saw a thousand suns shine down from above me and pierced and broke into fragments of the dark cloud. It broke up the dark cloud that was trying to destroy America, which had enveloped America. At the same moment, the angel upon whose head still shone the word union, the angel whose head still had the word union, U-N-I-O-N, -N, which bore our national flag in one hand and a sword in the other, descend from the heavens. So the angels are coming down from heaven attended by legions of white spirits. These immediately joined the inhabitants of America, you and I, who I perceived were well nigh overcome. In other words, the American people were overcome. They were being overcome by what had cost across our country, where all of these armies had come from that were trying to destroy America, but who immediately taking courage again, listen to that, who immediately taking courage again, closed up their broken ranks and renewed the battle. That's why I wanted to share this with you today. He removed the battle, the third great battle. And I, I lost some of it. I tried to print this. I don't quite have it all here. But then once more I beheld the villages, towns, and cities springing up again, where I'd seen them before. While the bright angel planting the, the azure standard he had brought into the midst of them cried with a loud voice, while the star, here's important, while the stars remain and the heavens send down dew upon the earth, so long shall the union last. And taking from his brow the crown on which blazoned the word union, he placed it upon the standard uh, while the people kneeling down said amen. Notice the people were kneeling down and said amen. This tells us they were praying. As I said earlier in Luke 18, 1, we ought to pray at, ahead at all times and not to lose heart. This is why I wanted to share this podcast with you, that we pray at all times. And here we see in this vision that the people were kneeling down and said, Amen. As the scene faded in this vision, General Washington said that this feminine figure, mysterious feminine figure, went on to say a couple of things more. And she said, son of the Republic, three great perils will come upon the Republic. The most fearful is the third. The most fearful is the third. But in this greatest conflict, the whole world united shall not prevail against her. Hear this again. We've had the Revolutionary War. We've had the Civil War. We've not had any other wars on our land, not like Europe has had. We've not had a lot of bloodshed in our country, not like other countries have. But she said the greatest, the thir greatest peril, the third, is the greatest conflict in the whole world, united, but it shall not prevail against America. It shall not prevail against America. And then she went on to say, let every child of the Republic learn, let every child of the Republic learn to live for his or her God. Learn to live for his or her God, for his or her land, and for the Union. I'm going to repeat that again. Let every child, every man and woman of the Republic, that means you and I, 
Learn to live for our God. Learn to live for our land and for the union of our land. Why is the word union important? And I'm going to read to you a scripture from Psalms 133. And I, many years ago, I had an experience, which I won't take time to tell you now. But I wanted to know why the union was important in a certain organization I was working in. Why was it important? And the Lord took me to this scripture. The union is very important. It says in verse chapter, Psalms 133, Psalm 133, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. Behold, how good it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. Remember the Civil War? They said, let everybody love one another. You are all brothers. We're all born because of the God, the Creator, gave you life. So let us learn, I'll play it, to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head. That means the anointing. It means the presence of the Holy Spirit. It is like the precious oil upon the head coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard. Aaron was a priest. He was the brother of Moses. And he was anointed for a certain job at that time in history. But you and I are living in history now. And we have people that want to destroy our country because they hate our God. They hate our Judeo-Christian values. And they're coming from all the countries of the world and crossing into our border illegally. We don't know how many of them are good, and I'm sure there are some good and righteous people, but how many of them are evil who want to destroy this land of America? They come with evil motives in our hearts, so it says we must pray. We must humble ourselves and pray. At all times pray. And then it said, um, the, the, the voice said, um, listen and learn. And the question is, what is it do we need to learn? What do I need to learn? One of the things I was thinking about was that we need to learn to pray for courage. It's easy to keep our tongues tied. I was listening to somebody, a Jewish man, a Jewish Christian on, on YouTube the other day, and he said he noticed that he, was try he wore a, a Jewish symbol like this. Now I have the cro cross on, but he was wearing the, uh, the menorah on his, on his thing. And he says, I noticed I wanted to cover it up. And he said, why should I do that? Because people today, we have anti-Semitics all over our country. And he realized he is a man with his own YouTube program. And he's a Messianic Jew. And he himself was worried about exposing this chain he wears with the menorah on it. And I'm wearing my cross deliberately everywhere I go today. No matter if I'm grocery store or wherever I'm out. I keep it on me because we need to let people know that we believe in a living God. We believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we believe there's purpose and direction for your life. That you are here at this time for a purpose. And ask God what is the purpose he created you for. In, he, in Ephesians 3.11, it talks about we are God's workmanship. He's created you with a purpose. And he wants you to fulfill that purpose. And he has a plan for your life. He has a plan for my life, for my husband's life. Because we are here at this time. And we are told by this vision that God's plan, plan's highest good, is he wants to keep this country, the place where freedom reigns, where freedom reigns, where the freedom to speak, the freedom to um, pray, the freedom to go to church, whatever religion you're in, the freedom to um, have guns in your arm, in your, in your house. All of these freedoms are being trying to take away from us because we're being deceived, we're being lied to. We don't know who to believe. But if you read the Word of God and look at it and ask God to give you the truth of who it is you need to listen to, who's got something for you. But the Bible can't go wrong. It says, they'll hold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. I could tell you a lot of examples of it, but I thank you, Father, today that we can talk together and I can talk with the people, my viewers. And Lord, let them know that they can put their trust in you. Just as Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, that we can put our faith in God and not in the wisdom of men. Um, this is what God, Paul said, that you, and I'm praying now, even though it doesn't sound like it, that we can put our trust in God, not the wisdom of men. Not what they're saying on the news channels. But let's put our faith in one place only, in the wisdom of God. 
I mean, excuse me, in the, not in the wisdom of men, but in God himself. I'm going to say that again because I'm reading it wrong. That your faith should not rest in the wisdom of men, but on God and his power. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5. Our faith must be placed someplace. Where do you want to put your faith in? You don't want to put your faith in a, the president. You don't want to put your faith in a senator. You want to put your faith in God and his power. And so, Father, I pray now that you'll give people revelation knowledge of what it is that we're called to live by faith. We're called to walk by faith. We're called to walk in the light, to walk in the truth. And I pray now for you as I talk to you. I'm praying now that the Holy Spirit will come down upon you and anoint you with truth and with grace and his mercy. He loves to pour out his grace upon you because he loves you, because he cares for you, because he died for you. Because he wants to give you life. Jesus came that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. So thank you for listening to me today and I'll look forward to talking to you again.